Hello and welcome to season three of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Chuck DeGroat, professor at Western Theological Seminary. In this season, we are discussing faith and vocation. This episode was filmed during the 2017 Writers' Workshop co-sponsored by Western Theological Seminary, Hope College, and Writing for Your Life. Today's guests are Dwight Baker and Elizabeth Palmer. Dwight is the CEO and president of Baker Publishing, and Elizabeth is the books editor for The Christian Century. The pair sat down to discuss faith and Christian publishing. So, Elizabeth, tell us about Christian Century and current trends in publishing. Mm -hmm. The Christian Century is a mainline Protestant magazine. We have a circulation of about 26,000, and that has remained pretty steady over the last 40 years. Our average age of our reader is probably late 50s, but oddly, that average age has also remained steady over the years. So it's not that we have older readers who are getting older. Mm -hmm. We have constantly new readers and new subscribers. Most of our readers are pastors, and so they're, it, I'm the book review editor, so I decide which books get reviewed in the century. And I, when I look through these books, I'm looking for books that would appeal to pastors, so that means not just books by religious publishers such as yourself, but also maybe the latest bestseller that's getting a lot of press, the book about Emmett Till and the, that so many people are writing about, or mm. the book about cognitive science. And so I try to cast the net widely in terms of what we review, but I always rely on the steady influx of really great scholarship from Baker and the other publishers that produce religious content and that, that do it so well. So what, what does it look like for you to be on the other end? You're, you're the one who's producing this great content. Mm -hmm. How is that looking for you? Well, at Baker Publishing Group, we do serve the mainline movement. And based on our mission, based on our legacy, we also serve a number of other branches of the evangelical church in North America. So that would be all the way from you know, conservative evangelical and Baptist all the way through mainstream, mainline Protestant. We also have a division that serves the charismatic church. And we publish as well even a Catholic commentary series. So we've, we've branched out beyond what evangelical might have been at the time of our founding, which was many decades ago, mm -hmm. which was a very, a very isolated and insular group to reflect the trends in the church. And so as an independent Baker Publishing Group is capable of adapting to changes in the church and responding to where the church is growing and what are the priorities for those church members, for those writers, for those pastors. And so the short version of what we're looking for are things that are relevant to both laity and pastors and reflecting the nature of the evangelical church and what it's uh, cognizant of what groups are speaking across the divides that had separated it in previous generations and responding to the needs and demands and changing characteristics of the church would be our priority. That sounds a lot like what we are looking for at the Christian Century in our articles. Maybe our articles are tiny microcosms of the larger projects that you publish. Yeah, people, people come to us with the topics. It's not one where we as a publisher are out ahead of them. Uh, sometimes we find unique voices that are just that, they're prophetic and they're speaking ahead of the group. But mm -hmm. the church tends to move as a mob. Mm -hmm. And as a, as a publisher, we're, we're trying to get our works out to as many voices, uh, many readers as possible. And so it, it responds to that, but it's typically not out on the cutting edge. Um, mm -hmm. And that's in part just because the, the structure of it is serving kind of an aggregate. Um, the church has a body. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but it's always exciting when you find a book, and I'm sure this is, this is true for editors, book review editors as well, mm -hmm. that is expanding a category, um, exploring an area that has been um, not recognized mm -hmm. and being able to be you know, some of the first voices in that. Um, yeah. You watch for those opportunities. Yeah. 
And it's kind of like magic when you find that, isn't it? Do you, do you get that feeling mm -hmm. like you suddenly know you've hit gold for, for publishing? I remember I was talking earlier today with some people about an article that I edited for the Christian Century, not a book review, but an upfront article. And I went to this talk at the American Academy of Religion annual conference of all places. It's a really mm -hmm. academic gathering. But I just knew there was something in that story. And the author was talking about how, as a little girl, she couldn't wear a dress to church. Her mom wanted her to wear a dress, and it just didn't feel right on her body, and she never understood why. And when she grew up, she became a biblical scholar. She still struggled to put herself into gender categories. And she, read, she was reading the story of Jesus and the hemorrhaging woman. And she, the woman touches Jesus, and the power drains out of him. She touches his cloak, and the power drains out of him. Mm -hmm. And Julie, this author, had this novel interpretation of the story and how Jesus is subverting gender categories. The power leaks out of him, and that was a feminizing thing to do, to be leaky, to be porous. Mm -hmm. And she just gave this amazing presentation, and I sat there at this academic conference and thought, that's it. That's going to be an article for the Christian century. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I thought it was... And it was well-received? I think it, it was well-received. Mm -hmm. It's always hard to know how well-received if we don't receive angry letters. We presume it's well-received. Our, okay. our readers aren't really active in commenting, but it, was, but it was shared on Facebook and mm -hmm. shared around a bit, tweeted out and that sort of thing. Okay. So. Yeah, we've, we've found that as publishers as well. And in this case, when we're publishing, let's say something more edgy, uh, potentially controversial, I, I used to feel long ago that we would get punished with angry letters mm -hmm. and whatever protest. And, and um, in our context, you just get ignored. Mm -hmm. and which is which is a punishment in itself, mm -hmm. but even even conversations I've had today with writers who have said, you know, I could you could publish me, but you're probably going to get angry letters. Mm -hmm. I wish I got more. Mm -hmm. um, and the few that I have, and phone calls, uh, I took one uh, a few weeks ago, but it was it was a complaint about a book that we published, but it was a very respectful uh, person who was protesting, but also willing to converse about it. And it was, a, it was a very satisfying conversation, considering he wanted to talk to the president of a publishing company that published a book that he vehemently disagrees with. Mm. And we had, I, I feel, over 20 minutes, a very engaging conversation of understanding each other's viewpoints. Mm -hmm. And I, I thanked him at the beginning and at the end of the call for being concerned enough and engaged enough to actually take the time, because in most cases, they just wander off and uh, mm -hmm. they don't take the time to push back. But in the case of a, a complaint, and you might find the same, at least these are people that recognize there's something very important at stake, mm -hmm. and that something's shifting and that publishing is a part of it, mm -hmm. and that we have a common priority for the written word. Well, those are, those are a couple of things that are tremendously important and they're a common space mm -hmm. that you have, even with people that are, that are criticizing you mm -hmm. uh, for producing a work. Sure. And I, I wish it wouldn't be years and years between angry letters and angry phone calls, yeah. uh, because otherwise you're just speaking into like an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. And the books that, let's say, are too, are too edgy to be received, mostly they just remain unsold, mm -hmm. which is, there's something very sad about that. Yeah. But in some cases, it's, uh, they're not, the church isn't ready for those works. I think the, those conversations, when you do get the rare, angry, thoughtful, but angry phone call or letter, those conversations can really help you clarify your mission and how mm -hmm. your, your mission in one sense doesn't change with the winds of time and the vagaries of the publishing industry. Yeah. But, it, but you're always open to revelation from God and the reality is we live in context, right? Mm -hmm. So while the core mission doesn't change, the way it manifests might shift in, in small ways and that's the tricky discernment that I think we all go through. Yeah, because the, the, the church keeps doing that. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. highly prejudiced toward an independent business model as a, as a faith-based mm -hmm. publisher. Uh, there are others, there are ministry-based or denominational-based. Mm -hmm. And on the other end, there are corporate, you know, multinational, um, mm -hmm. you know, News Corps and, and Hachette and others. Mm -hmm. and, all, and, and then independents are in the middle. Mm -hmm. And we lack the capital of the multinationals and we lack the, I guess, the embeddedness in the faith community that some of the small niche publishers have. Mm -hmm. And we work in this middle space. So we often, we're, we're getting beat up at both ends, but it keeps you very much on your toes. 
And as an, as an independent, the reason why, after this many years, I'm very prejudiced about that model is there's no non-publishing imperatives that are interrupting your work. Mm -hmm. If we serve the church mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. they reward us yeah. with their purchases, which provides revenue and capital to continue to do the work. Yeah. If we serve them badly, they don't, they don't mostly don't call, they don't do anything, they just don't buy your books and you get, mm -hmm. uh, you get punished in that way. So the punishment is swift and it's immediate, and, but either case, reward or penalty, it's all related to publishing. And so in corporate, there might be other you know, profit objectives, whatever. In, in ministries, there are ministry priorities that subordinate the publishing. And there's many, many narratives of, of publishers that are doing extraordinarily good work in every respect, and then some sort of, some sort of disruption comes down the hall from the ministry that mm -hmm. had nothing to do with the publishing activity, but derails it. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I'm bias toward the independence is the rewards and penalties are so immediate and they're all about publishing, book publishing only, and your ability to serve the church. Mm -hmm. A minute ago you, you said something in the negative that I want to recast in the positive. You said we lack the capital of the large multinationals and we lack the tight, close connections of the small denominational public. Mm -hmm. what, if you, what if you turned it around and said we have more capital than the t small mm -hmm. denominational publishers and we have more church connections, we have our fingers in yeah. this wide range of who, who we define as church, mm -hmm. but we're there and these large multinational for-profit or secular publishers don't have yeah. that. Yeah, you just recited our speech to literary agents. Okay, there we right go. Right there, yeah, <laughs> so if, we're, if we are competing with larger, mm -hmm. uh, well-resourced publishers, the New York houses, We'll describe just that. We're in the community, and, oh, and yeah. we actually have a level of engagement that surpasses theirs. Yeah. And with the niche publishers that are usually finding writers faster and earlier in their career, and, and many, many writers emerge from that, what we'll say to, to those writers are, we can reach more people, and we can mm -hmm. invest more in your, in your writing. Mm -hmm. and your long-term publishing career than the house that is current, you're currently working with. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we do try to use that as uh, an advantage, sure. and it's, it's all couched in the service we provide mm -hmm. to those writers. So I have a question for you. Do you. To what extent do you publish things that, you, that, that get to the edges of what you personally believe about God and about the world? How, how willing, how porous can those boundaries at the edges be? And either mm -hmm. on, is it, it might be way too conservative, however that's defined, or way too liberal, mm -hmm. or too edgy, according to your faith. Yeah. But how do you, as a publisher, mm -hmm. then make those decisions? What will you not publish? Right. No, that's a good question. And first of all, it's not about me, mm -hmm. um, because we, as a publishing house, have always published beyond any single position. Mm -hmm. Even, and we're a three-generation family business, so my, my father, Herman Baker, was the founder, and, and mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, my grandfather, Herman Baker, was the founder, and Richard Baker, my father, followed him, and I followed Richard. And so, mm -hmm. even if we go back to the first generation, there was, there was no single view of, say, dogma mm -hmm. that prevailed over the whole publishing program. Mm -hmm. So, it has always been a scope beyond what a single proprietor might prefer. And so, apparently that's a comfort zone, because we've been in that comfort zone for 80 years, nearly. And it's more about what is unique about Baker that allows us to serve those communities well, and what is off and outside of those communities that we wouldn't serve well. Mm -hmm. For example, I'll meet with writers that will say, I'd like to publish with you, but you probably going to have a disruption because other, other authors on your list aren't going to like what I, what I have to say. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm able to say, look, that's, that's fine. No author has editorial control over the, the mm -hmm. whole list, although some historically have tried. Mm -hmm. And we've had to explain, look, we, we just don't need you for that. And if you want to be with a confessional publisher that is of viewpoints that are very much aligned with yours, there's very good choices. And we do lose authors to that model. And it's, it's disappointing and painful but it's better than giving editorial control to one person who isn't even part of the company. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's a, it's an unhappy decision, but it's one where we've always been firm. But the, the scope is more about, are we the best publisher for you, if that's where you're coming from? 
because if that's the case, our reputation isn't going to be a, any enhancement to you as a writer, mm -hmm. and your inclusion into this group isn't going to be an affinity that's going to help you. Mm -hmm. And so if, if the person is that far on the edge, there's probably a better publisher for her or him than Baker mm -hmm. if they're reaching that kind of challenge because we want to be the best choice. Yeah, I think I, I constantly make that kind of decision and negotiation too at the Christian Century, thinking who is, I, I might be sent a book that is really amazing, but it's not written for our audience. And I just know that it's not written for our audience. Mm -hmm. So I might pass it over for a review. Or I might receive an article pitch from someone who wants to write for the front section of the magazine or even be working on or editing an article and think, oh, this is really good writing. It illuminates the life of faith. But the author is presupposing something that our readers aren't really even asking that question. They're mm -hmm. in a different spot. So I think you do have to know your audience and know who you're serving and, and what's the purpose of your writing. Yeah, yeah, you'd wanna think what does Century do best? So for your subscribers, what do they need most from you? Mm -hmm. And for those, for those books, what would the Century readers most engage with. Mm -hmm. So otherwise we're just wasting each other's time. Yeah. yeah.